Good evening and welcome into God's house once again on this Lord's Day. We ask the Lord's rich blessing upon each and every one as we worship before him. Let us stand and hear God's call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him, vic him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. People of God, let's worship the Lord with joyful hearts. Our strength and help is in the name of the Lord, and he is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's worship God further in song as we sing from the Red Hymnals, number 274. confess our holy faith as we recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found on the back of the, the Nicene Creed, that is, found on the back of the bulletins. Let us all, with one heart and one voice, confess, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. 
and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. may be seated. The evening offering will now be received and it will be for the general fund. Now let's come before God with our evening prayers. Let us pray. Our Father in, in heaven, once again, we quiet our hearts to draw near to you, to open our ears, to hear what you have to say to us. And we know that all that you say is always profitable for us. It is exactly what we need. And so, Father, we pray that you would indeed Feed us with that manna from heaven, your word, by which we are sanctified and made more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That more and more we set aside the things of this world. That more and more we put to death the deeds of the flesh. More and more we begin to distance ourselves from this world and its principles and more and more conform to your most wonderful will and law. And our Father in heaven, we pray that that would always be a yearning in our hearts, a hungering and thirsting after righteousness, that we may never feel comfortable in this world, in the ways of this world. But our Father, we might set our minds on things above, where you are seated at your Father's right hand. And Lord, be that we might be taken up with those eternal matters of the soul, and our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed bless us this week, that we may not mindlessly go through uh, these days uh, chasing after the wind, chasing our own dreams, uh, that we might be like the Apostle Paul who put out every effort, uh, every ounce of energy to strive for that goal that you have set for all of your people, 
and that is holiness, even as the Lord Jesus Christ prayed, uh, that we might be sanctified, and that we're sanctified through your word. And our Father in heaven, even as the Apostle John tells us, that we all should have that hope of what the Lord Jesus Christ will do when he comes, uh, and that, we'll, that we will see him. And so, our Father, we pray that we might be preparing for that glorious day, whether it be when he returns at the end of this world, or whether it be that our, our lives come to an end on this earth and we begin to live in your presence for eternity. Our Father in heaven, we pray then that you would bless us this evening as we hear your word. And our Father in heaven, we pray that we might always be mindful of the fact that you are the one that brings us into a relationship with yourself. It is not because of our intellect, it is not because of our wills, uh, but rather it is the working of your Holy Spirit. And through your word, uh, that you bring us into such an intimate con uh, relationship with you, a saving relationship. And our Father in heaven, we pray that for uh, our children. We pray that as they grow, they may be made wise unto salvation. We pray that for our relatives and friends and acquaintances, that you might open their eyes, that they might see the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world. Our Father in heaven, once again, we pray uh, for your church. And Lord, we pray for churches up and down this land and across the world. We know that it's a hostile environment in which uh, for them to minister. And there are so many discouragements along the way. Uh, but, our Father, we pray that you would indeed um, grant your churches strength and to your servants strength, that they may have boldness to proclaim thy word, that they may not be pressured by the world to speak things that they want to hear, uh, itching ears, uh, but rather, our Father, that we might uh, preach your word and your word alone, that we might bring the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is only that uh, which is a power of God unto salvation. Our Father in heaven, again, we pray for those that are sick in our congregation. We ask, lift them up before you. We pray, Lord, that you would grant them sustaining grace. And Lord, even through their sufferings and struggles, we pray that uh, the assurance of their faith may be strong and an anchor for the soul. Our Father in heaven, we pray also for our missionaries, again, not only ours, but those uh, that you've sent from all of your churches. And we pray that you would bless their work, and Lord, that you would encourage them and give them strength, uh, that the gospel may continue to go forth from one end of the world to another. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would uh, also hear the prayers of your people, uh, the struggles that we face. We know that they are of interest to you and great concern, and so, our Father, we pray that we might be uh, assured that as we bring them before you, that you will address them according to your most perfect will, and in a way that will uh, bless your people and bless all those around us. And so we pray that you would hear our prayers, and Lord, grant us that peace of knowing that you are working these things out for each and every one of us.
And now let's stand and sing from the Red Hymnals number 658. Our catechism portion this evening found on page 871, and uh, we're going to take a, a bunch of questions today from um, question 29 uh, all the way to 32. Talking about how redemption is applied to uh, God's people. So page 871, question number 29. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by his Holy Spirit. How doth the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. What is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills, he doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. What benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? They that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, adoption, and sanctification and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. 
And then we'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16, and then a couple of verses from Acts chapter 16. So first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verses 6 to 16. So instead of, as we've been looking at this, this morning, instead of um, preaching the gospel in terms of the wisdom that this world has, Paul says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the, thi the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that we might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And as I say, just a couple of verses from Acts chapter 16 to see these truths in action. Uh, chapter 16 and verses 12 to 15. Well, I guess I'll start with verse 11. Therefore sailing... From Troas we ran a straight course to Samothus, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a foremost city of that part of Macedonia colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who, who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So, Father, reading of God's word. Dear people of God, we've considered salvation from the angle of Christ's offices, namely prophet, priest, and king, how he purchased for us redemption through his uh, atoning sacrifice on the cross. But now we turn, as you saw in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, to the consideration of how this salvation purchased for us by Christ, is applied to us, to individuals. And here is a subject that has been the center of much division down the ages. Because some believe that salvation is embraced by man himself. In other words, without any help from God, without, as they put it, any interference by God. Whereas others, like ourselves, believe and teach that salvation is sovereignly applied by God's Spirit. And in between these two extremes are many 
other views, I should say extreme, I'm not saying that what we believe is extreme, but the outer edges uh, of the spectrum, within that there are all kinds of different views. And we see that it is important for us to be straight in this regard so that we may have assurance about our salvation. Nothing is more important for the believer to be assured of his salvation, to know that he is saved and he's a child of God. And anything that challenges that, anything that uh, puts that under uh, stress uh, has to be avoided and has to be cleared up uh, by the correct teaching and understanding of the scriptures. Nothing is more practical to us than the knowledge that we are saved, that we're the, we're the children of God. And it is no accident then that the Spirit puts high premium on that. The Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are the children of God. God gives us his redemptive promises and takes an oath so that we might have an anchor for the soul, that we might experience day by day the joy of knowing that we are his children and that he cares for us. So in considering this subject, let's first of all look at the agents of redemption. First of all, as we've seen in our passage, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. We're told that the Lord opened Lydia's heart so that she responded to the message of the gospel. Paul teaches that it is the Holy Spirit who teaches us to understand what God has freely given to us that is the gospel. Made that very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Natural man doesn't understand the things of God. He's blind. He cannot discern those things. In fact, he rejects those things, which is borne out by the fact that the world crucified the Lord of glory. That's their reaction. That's their estimation of the Son of God. He came into the world and he was rejected by his own. Never mind the other nations of the world. He was rejected by his own people, in all that he did, in all that he taught. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the agents of the various aspects of salvation, as indicated by our confessions. That's why when we look at the Apostles' Creed in the Heart of a Catechism, it makes a point that, do you notice it says that the Apostles' Creed is divided into three sections? And what are those sections about? They're about God the Father and our creation and providence, the way that he takes care of us, and the Lord Jesus Christ and our salvation, and the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. Every aspect of our spiritual life is in the hands of God. And the canons of Dort do the same thing. Uh, when they look at unconditional election, I mean, who is it that we focus on? Well, the Father, who before the creation of the world, set his love upon us, elected us to be his very young. And then in time, the Lord Jesus Christ, limited atonement, that he purchases our salvation. He, he gives his life a ransom for many. And then irresistible grace, what is that? That's the working of God's Holy Spirit, whereby irresistibly, he takes the benefits of Christ's death and applies it to each and every one of us. And we see that uh, in action here in this passage that, uh, that we've read, not only in Corinthians, but also in Acts. Our only hope is in God himself. If man left to himself, was left to himself, then all would be lost. Just as Adam and Eve, with everything in their favor, they turned away from God. Many continue to embrace the error that man can choose for himself. But what bondage is that? To say, it's up to you, you have to decide, you have to use your own wisdom. Well, what wisdom do people have other than the wisdom of this world? And in the wisdom of this world, they crucify the Lord of glory. And so every sinner is going to crucify the Lord of glory. Were it not for the work of the Holy Spirit. People of God, let us thank the Lord for our salvation and conversion. Let us proclaim the gospel, but also let us pray earnestly that the Holy Spirit would open their hearts, because we cannot. We cannot do it by argumentation. It's one thing to engage in apologetics. It's one thing to engage in, in 
uh, giving a reason for the hope that lies in us. But don't think too much of yourselves that simply by winning arguments, you're going to win heart. That's a fool's dream. It will never happen. It's only going to happen by the working of God's Holy Spirit. And so we need to be careful that we trust in God. We look to Him. His work is irresistible. Our work is resistible and, is, and often is. But when the Holy Spirit works, then there is certainly a response, a response of opening hearts. As we're told, the Lord opened Lydia's heart. Does this not indicate that the heart was closed? I mean, if the Lord had to open her heart, then the simple conclusion from that is that the heart was closed. It wasn't open. She didn't open it herself. It was shut tight. But God took the initiative. And God opened her heart. Notice it does not say that he knocked and waited for her to open it. That's not what the passage says, does it? It doesn't say, we don't misuse that verse in Revelation chapter 3 and say, well, this is a picture of how salvation works. The Lord Jesus Christ comes and he stands outside of the, of the door of our hearts and he respectfully and patiently knocks, waiting for us to open. But he never opens that door himself. Well, such is a gross error. And Acts chapter 16 proves it beyond a shadow of a doubt. No, the Lord is the one that opens the hearts. And thank God that that is the case. Notice people that were seekers like Cornelius. And Lydia was seeking. She was down by the river praying. But their hearts had to be opened. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter whether we've been raised among the people of God like Nicodemus was. It doesn't matter whether we've been taught the things of God. That heart will never open by itself. The Lord has to open it. The working of God's Holy Spirit has to be in play. And so the whole error of Arminius and Pelagian errors are dangerous to our souls and to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't let them have victory. We can't let them persuade God's people that such is the case. Especially those that are genuine Christians. And now they look at their salvation and they think it was dependent upon them. But if that's what they think, then they will never be assured of their faith. They will always be doubting. What happens down the road when I don't feel like this. What happens down the road when I, if I change my mind? They will always have those questions in their hearts. And it is no wonder then that people often go forward to make a confession of their faith. Why? Over and over again? I mean, it's like he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And all the time we go through that. What kind of a relationship is that? No, the Lord opens our hearts. And when we see in our hearts that love for God and love for the gospel and a desire to embrace him and to serve him, that is proof positive that he has opened our heart because that's not how normal people, earthly people behave. They don't love the things of God. They don't understand the things of God. So how is it that that's happened to us? Because of the simple fact that he opened our hearts. We might not know when it is that he opened our heart. We may not be able to put a time and a day on it and a year on it. But there's no mistaking the fact that he has opened our hearts. Because we love him and we serve him and we honor him in all that we do. But not only that, but he enlightens our minds. The work of the Holy Spirit is mysterious in many ways, but it is also experienced by us. We don't understand the ways of the wind, but we do experience its presence and effects. So also with the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the analogy that the Lord Jesus Christ uses in John chapter 3. 
The Holy Spirit, like the wind, is sovereign. It, it blows where it, it wills. We don't control the wind. We don't tell the wind which way to blow. No, it's sovereign. And when he blows, it is irresistible. No man knows such things. They are beyond us. Sinners will never understand without the Holy Spirit. Man's natural response is seen in Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 to 18. There was no one righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. No one fears God. They do whatever they like. That's the way they react to God. Even though he's in heaven and we're down earth, we're so weak and fickle, and yet we act like we own the world. And we stick out our chests before God. And we demand that we're going to go our own way. To believers, such mysteries are made known. We might have thought that we believe because we figured out the gospel, but the truth is God made it clear to us. Let us thank God always for our faith which was a gift of God, not of our own, says Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. Yes, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we might say, see, Peter figured it out. But no, that's not true, is it? Because the Lord Jesus Christ made that very clear. He says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You didn't figure it out. Mankind didn't figure it out. But my Father in heaven has made it known to you, even as he makes it known to each and every child of God. We would never have come to it ourselves. But thank God he enlightened our dark minds and filled our minds with his truth so that when we saw the Lord Jesus, see the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did, we don't simply pass by anymore. We fall down on our knees and we bow before him and we confess that he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And along with Thomas, we say, my Lord and my God. Let us not rob God of his glory. But they're also not only agents of redemption, as we pointed out, but they are avenues of redemption. They are human avenues. Acts chapter six, 16 verse 14 teaches that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to do what? To respond to Paul's message, to heed the things spoken by Paul. So there is that human avenue that God uses. Here we are reminded that the work of salvation is the work of the triune God, but God uses secondary means to accomplish his purposes. And this is indicated by the fact that we are commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are to disciple the nations. God has appointed servants to preach the gospel. And men are taught to view such messengers as precious, for they bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. We ought not to underestimate the servants of God. They are nothing in and of themselves. They have no higher qualities than we do. They're not more intellectual than we are. They are useful because God has set them apart for the ministry, for the preaching of the gospel, and he's equipped them. And so when they come to us and they are faithful in their calling and they preach the gospel, then their words are indeed precious to our souls. The Spirit ensures that his work and that of preaching the gospel go hand in hand. The Holy Spirit works hand in hand with the secondary avenues. And so, yes, we preach, but it is the Holy Spirit that convicts. It is the Holy Spirit that opens the heart and enlightens the mind and bends the will. So for us to speak in terms of how many people we have brought to Christ is utter nonsense. We should never even speak that way. It is so confusing when we do so. Because people think, oh, the more people you bring, the more effective you seem to be. So we're going to use you more. As though you are a better, a, a, a better preacher than anyone else. And therefore we lift up people and put, on, put them on a pedestal. And the real glory that should go to the Holy Spirit is diverted. No, people of God, Paul never took glory in the people that he preached to. 
He never said, you're one of my disciples. You're my... I mean, he abhorred that attitude. Oh, I'm of Peter, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Paul detested that. It was a negative. He says, who is Peter? Who am I? We're just instruments in God's hands. We're just avenues, channels of God's grace and bringing of God's word. No, it is the Holy Spirit that is in charge of that. They're not only human avenues, but the gospel message. What did Paul preach to Lydia or Peter to Cornelius or to the Jews? Paul is very clear in his preaching. He said, we preach Christ and Christ crucified. He gloried in the cross and was not ashamed of the gospel, for it was a power of God unto salvation. Some people see the gospel preaching as foolishness to the Jews and to the others. It's a stumbling block. But to those that are being saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Sad to say, many abandon the gospel for liberalism. Whereas on the other end of the scale, some have abandoned the gospel and replaced it with simply moralistic pursuits in various holiness movements. The whole point is just to improve people. The whole point is to get them acting in a certain way and following certain rules. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not um, uh, behavior modification. It's the changing of our hearts and our minds and our wills. It's a wholesale giving our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. That we say we are not our own. We belong to him, body and soul. Not that we listen to some of the uh, uh, commands and we conform to them. No, it's more than that. It's our whole life belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is easy for believers to pine for such preaching. Something to do, something practical. But the gospel is viewed as old and not practical. No, gospel preaching must address the sin of man and God's forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And the gospel goes on to shape all of life, but it never cuts loose from the cross. It never cuts loose from the Lord Jesus Christ. When we take our eyes away from the cross, then we have fallen from grace. The sinners of this world do not need options or direction on how to improve their lives. They need to be saved. They're dead and they're blind. Only when they are saved through the Lord Jesus Christ will they be able to live obedient and holy lives. Let us not give up the gospel message. Lydia was not saved because Paul was so loving and kind, but because he brought no other message than Christ and him crucified for her sins. And finally, the acts of redemption. First of all, the response of faith. We're told that the Holy Spirit opened Lydia's heart to respond or heed the message of Paul. Here we note that there are experiential elements to the working of the Holy Spirit. The first of which is a positive response. Not only are our minds enlightened and our hearts opened, but our wills are moved and activated to respond. We must not interpret an interest in the gospel as faith, nor may we view our association and attendance at church with faith. We must respond with all our heart and soul and mind, as well as our will to embrace fully the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, to embrace the Lord himself. I mean, when you fall in love, that is something that you experience with your whole body. You love this person. You, you, uh, you, you give your allegiance to this person. You're going to be faithful to this person. And we, and we bring that relationship in the form of marriage. That's the way it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the question is, is that the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is he just another person that we know and we respect and we learn from? No, it has to be more than that. It has to be more than that. 
No, our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ has to be one, as I've already indicated, where we, with all of our heart, mind, and strength, say like the, like, uh, the Apostle Thomas and everyone else with him, my Lord and my God. If we cannot utter those words with all the feeling and power that we have, then we have not known who the Lord Jesus Christ is. No, he is our Lord and our God. He's not just the best teacher in the world. He's not a good guide of how we ought to live our lives. He's not like the philosophers of this world. No, he is my Lord and my God, to whom I give all of my allegiance, to whom I give all my life. I follow him in all things and bow before him because he is my creator, and he's the one that saved me by his death on the cross. And how do we do that? It is by faith in him. Faith is not simply an intellectual assent. It is not just knowledge. No, it's with all of my heart, with all of my being. I love him. I trust him. And I'm ready to give my life for him. To live my life to honor and glorify him. To set aside my dreams and my goals for life. Not to see my life as wasted, but rather life gained. That is what Lydia and all those with her did when they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They put aside all their idols. They turned their backs on all of that to worship the living God. But also there's obedience in baptism. Another way in which the redeeming work of the Holy Spirit is made experiential is through obedience in being baptized. It is alarming how many Christians view baptism as an option and not that important. Their view is that baptism is not essential and does not save. Such a statement is born out of ignorance. We might say that a wedding ring is not the essence of marriage. But who would go around despising wedding rings as optional? Or even the ceremony as optional? We love each other. That's all that counts. Really? I hope people are not persuaded by that foolish idea. No, with marriage, there's that outward ceremony. And we rejoice in that. We make so much uh, about it. It's memorable for us. It ought to be more memorable for Christians that it is God bringing two lives together to love and to serve him together and to be faithful to one another in the bounds that he has set. Surely they afford to the marriage partners great tangible evidence of lasting love. So baptism serves as a sign between God and the one baptized of a covenant relationship. I will be a God to you and to your descendants uh, that come after you. At Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. Not one of them thought that baptism was optional. Not one of them said, you know, I can wait down the road when I'm ready for it. Not one said that. All 3,000, not only did they believe, but they were baptized. None of the apostles said, well, there's no rush. I mean, after all, we got 3,000. We should, uh, you know, do a few at a time, and it'll take months to get everyone done. They didn't do that. On that day, 3,000 souls were added to the people of God. The Ethiopian eunuch didn't say, well, you know, we're on the road. We'll have to wait. I'll wait till I get home. No, there was water by the side of the road and they stopped and he was baptized. We as a church must not downplay baptism but call believers and their children to be baptized so that they might find comfort and assurance in this outward sign and our children may see what this relationship, covenant relationship brings forth in terms of fruit. That if we obey God, if we come to him, if we believe the things that he teaches us, then we will be made wise unto salvation. It doesn't come naturally simply because we're in a Christian home. Our hearts have to be open too. 
We have to be taught, just like the apostle preached. So we have to hear the message. And as we hear that message, albeit a little at a time over years, nevertheless, we become wise unto salvation. Salvation is not redundant for people that are raised in the covenant. No, it becomes even more important. And we want our children to come to obedience to Christ and love him. And finally, good works. We're told that Lydia insisted that Paul stay with her and receive her hospitality. As believers come to understand salvation and God's love, they in turn seek to display that love to others. As it says, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. How hearts seek to keep God's law, which is summarized in us loving God with all our heart, strength, and mind, and loving our neighbor even as we love ourselves. Of course, it begins with our brethren, as I've said so often. If we can't love our brothers and sisters in Christ in one's own church, how can we love anyone else? I mean, that's kind of equivalent to what it says. If you don't love your own family, then you're worse than pagans, because even they reach that point. I mean, not perfectly, but they love their, their families. And so if we can't love our own in terms of our Christian family, how in the world are we going to love, love anyone else? And how in the world are we going to love our enemies? We can't even love our friends. So that is certainly a sign of God working in us. And so we seek to extend love to our brethren. Here is a tangible means of detecting the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Do I love the brethren? Do I love those around me? Do I have a yearning for their salvation? Does it disturb me that they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Does that bother me at all? Or am I so cold-hearted, I can see a world that is perishing around me, and it doesn't bother me at all? I can get on with life and enjoy life myself and see all of these people drowning. I know, I don't know whether you heard this story before, um, but apparently this uh, missionary comes home and um, he shares with them uh, a story and he says, yeah, I, I was there on the mission field and um, this, this uh, you know, person was drowning in the river and all of these people were standing by the side of the river. No one helped. No one helped this guy. And he drowned. And everybody in the church was so shocked. And they thought, what kind of people are you uh, bringing the gospel to that they would do such a terrible thing? And then he said, you know, there are people walking around in your neighborhoods, your acquaintances, maybe your own family members, and they are perishing. And what is it that we're doing? Are we standing by? Not concerned? Well, our error is worse than them. And so that's how you made that point. That we cannot be unaware of the danger that people are in. In their sin and in their misery. A perishing world. We can't ignore that. We have to pray. We have to do whatever we can as the Spirit gives us utterance. As I related often about my father, he came to faith late to his regret and sorrow. But he made up for it, if one can speak that way. I mean, he went to every relative that we had. And he was not ashamed of the gospel. Even though he was known to be one that opposed the gospel, even in his own children. And yet he visited everyone. And he was not shy of bringing up the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. People of God, it is that care for others that is really the telling point of whether we have come to know the Lord himself. Whether we know the gospel ourselves. And when we know that we've been saved from such a terrible eternal destiny of misery and gnashing of teeth. And we've been saved from that. If we are truly thankful, then we will be concerned about others. 
you know, the, the man in the, in the, um, among graves that the Lord Jesus Christ cast out, cast out of uh, demons. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to go and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted to follow him. It's just a commendable thing. But you know, remember what he did? Jesus said, no. You don't, you don't show your love for me by walking around with me. I mean, there are some that I've called to do that. But you should go back home. You should go to where you live and be a light, be a salt for them. People of God, the gospel has an effect upon us. We don't start talking about good works as a basis of our salvation, no. Neither do we continue to look to works and always go there for the assurance of our salvation. It is a part, but so often it becomes the whole. We lose we, don't, we take our eyes off the confession. We take our eyes off the fact that we believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died on the cross for my sins. And we, and, and we make that of no importance, but we always look to our things. What am I doing good? What about these sins? And we always fixate on those things. But when we have this genuine love for others and we seek to pursue holiness and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, then that is proof that the Holy Spirit has begun a good work in us. And having begun it, he will bring it to completion. Now the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross is far too precious to put into the hands of men to distribute. No, it is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And we thank the Lord that it is. Because he's brought each and every one of us to himself and we are eternally grateful amen let us pray our father in heaven we thank you for drawing us to yourself even as your word teaches no man comes unto me lest the father draw him and our father in heaven we don't know why you should have drawn us because we are sinners just like everyone else. But it is that love, your love, that you set upon us. And we are truly humbled by that. And we pray that our lives may be a response of gratitude for what you have done. And that we may indeed give you all the glory. And that we may call others that have no hope. And think there is no way that things can improve. That we draw them and point them to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that they too might confess my Lord and my God. There's nothing more precious than that. That we can give to others and point others to. Our Father now we pray that you would bless us this week. May we be those that are sensitive to the condition of those around us and that we might indeed serve them by bringing your wonderful gospel. Hear our prayers and continue that work of gathering your people to yourself where we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us stand and respond from the new, te uh, the new hymnal, uh, the red hymnals as we sing number 300 and 87. Oops. That's not the right number. Huh? Oh, sorry. I said the blue because it was a different tune in the red, and I know that would trick us up. So let's sing it out of the, out of the blue hymnal, 387, and then the tune would be very familiar to us. So the blue hymnal number 387. I saw the Lord and afterward I knew He moved my soul to seek Him seeking me It was not I that found O oh, Savior true was found, was found of thee. 
It was not I that found O oh, Savior true. No, I was found, was found of Thee. Thou didst reach forth Thy hand in mine and fold. I woke and sank, not in the storm back sea. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. With the grace of Christ our Savior, and the Father's boundless love, with the Holy Spirit's favor, rest upon us from above. Thus may we abide in union with each other and the Lord, and possess in sweet communion joys which earth cannot afford.